I often get asked, what is the best matrix for drug testing? Well, the answer is there is no best. The decision should come down to the information you're trying to capture and the environment you're working in. Are you trying to capture impairment? Are you trying to capture recent use, historical use? This slide represents each matrix and its respective detection window. You will see here, blood has the shortest window. Usually within a couple of days, all drugs that are ingested have been cleared from the bloodstream and are sent to waste as metabolites. Blood is best for assessing a person's impairment state. Are they under the influence currently? Oral fluid mimics a pattern of blood about one to three days for most drugs. This is a great matrix for identifying recent drug use. Next is urine, which has a window for most drugs of three to five days, with the exception of marijuana and certain benzodiazepines. And I think we're all pretty familiar with the utility of urine testing. Then finally, hair, which gives you a 90-day window in most cases and really is a great way to understand an individual's lifestyle choices over a longer period of time. Today, our focus will be on oral fluid, but let's do a quick review of urine so we can compare these popular sample types. Urine is the most commonly utilized matrix in toxicology. It has a long history of use, and many are very comfortable with interpretation of drug testing results in urine. It has a long window of detection, about three to five days for most drugs, is cost efficient, contains high levels of metabolites and parent drug, allowing for ease of detection. We know a lot about urine, but so does everyone else, and it doesn't take long to find on the internet how to beat a drug test. Therefore, it is an ideal matrix for drug abuse, um, but it has definite limitations. It is the matrix most prone to adulteration, substitution, and intentional dilution. The best way to combat adulteration and substitution is through observed collections. These often require specially designated facilities and same-sex collectors. Observed collections are often very uncomfortable for both the collector and the donor and are often met with reluctance. But unfortunately, not even an observed collection can combat an intention to dilute. Finally, during these times of required physical distancing, many are not comfortable with observed collections in tight quarters, such as a restroom, or even more have moved to a telemedicine approach. Or fluid, has a slightly shorter detection window from urine, about one to three days for most drugs, providing us with information of recent drug use. Oral fluid is your best sample to prevent adulterations, substitution, and dilution because it is an observed collection every time. And as long as you wait that 10 minutes of not eating, drinking, or mouthwash, you can be confident of accurate results. You should be prepared to see only parent drug levels at much lower numbers than you see in urine. You may see metabolites, but don't be surprised if you only capture that parent drug. Now that we have reviewed the basics, let's dig in deeper. Oral fluid is rapidly becoming the sample of choice for drug testing. It is the ideal sample for populations that are at high risk for adulteration and dilutions. An individual can drink all the fluids they want and it will not affect the oral fluid like it would a urine result. Because it is an observed collection every time, there is no need for collectors to be same sex and no specially designated facilities are required. This is a great sample type for collections where observation of urine isn't possible or even appropriate. For example, workplace drug testing, youth populations, shy bladder, and transgender populations. And most recently, because of the pandemic, Many of our clients have moved to oral fluid because it complements their new protocols with touchless collections and physical distancing and allows organizations using telemedicine and telecommunications to continue to test. For example, Corden offers a video observed collection solution that works well with telemedicine or any remote method your organization or agency is using to monitor clients' adherence to their program goals. Finally, Oral fluid shows great promise for correlation to impairment and drug dosing evaluation because it correlates well with pharmacologic activity. So there is still a lot of exciting research happening for further application in those directions. I think it's really important to take a moment here to talk about the reliability of this sample. Oral fluid has come a very long way in the last 15 years and is absolutely as sensitive 
and as accurate as urine testing. Laboratories have learned a lot about the sample matrix and have used that knowledge and experience to improve the science. Tremendous advancements have come from improvements in technologies, extraction and sample cleanup techniques that have allowed us to create much more sensitive and accurate methodologies, allowing for lower cutoffs that are much more appropriate for oral fluid than initially thought. We have a better understanding of the pharmacokinetics, the pharmacodynamics of drugs, and their disposition in oral fluid. Lower cutoffs and a better understanding of what drugs and metabolites will be present and how to look for those drugs and metabolites have allowed for results that are just as sensitive and accurate as urine. As always, the exact same technologies, processes, quality control criteria, and accreditation expectations are applied to oral fluid that are applied to urine. Oral fluid has been embraced in the testing community from treatment centers, MAT clinics, courts and probation departments, therapeutic drug monitoring, workers' comp, and finally, in 2019, SAMHSA began to allow its use in federally regulated workplace drug testing. There are many devices on the market available for oral fluid, and I won't list them all for you here, but I have put some common ones into the slide. There are basically two testing options, point of care and laboratory-based testing. Many like point of care so they can obtain instant results while the donor is still present, allowing for instant conversations and immediate intervention. But there are some limitations to these devices. First, they have very limited drug panel option as compared to lab-based testing. Second, is the complication seen when a confirmation needs to be performed. Many of these devices do not collect enough sample to allow for sending to the lab for confirmation, and so a second collection in a different device might need to be performed. The ones that do collect enough sample um, to send off for further testing have complicated procedures in order to get the oral fluid out of the device. Laboratory-based testing is when the device is sent to the lab for the initial screen. You will usually receive initial results in under 24 hours, there's an extensive test offering available, and instrumentation is quality controlled. With this testing, you aren't faced with the subjective nature of reading the device. For the most part, there are two techniques utilized to obtain a sample, collection by a swab style device and the expectoration method. Expectoration is the method of stimulating the oral cavity and spitting into a collection vessel, resulting in what we call neat oral fluid. Stimulating the oral fluid production uh, could provide a dilution effect and potentially false negatives as a result. In addition, you know, many people feel this method is a little less sanitary. Finally, the swab devices. Swab devices work by placing a swab under the tongue for passive collection onto the device. And that usually takes about five minutes, but it could take up to 10. A very popular device is the Quantasol, seen here to the bottom left. It contains a buffer solution that both pulls the drug from the swab and preserves um, the specimen for transport to the lab. Many labs have validated their screening and confirmation techniques for this particular device. But what is really important in these devices that have buffer solution is the adequacy indicator. This indicator tells you that the total required volume of oral fluid has been collected. The buffer itself will dilute the sample, so it's important to gather that full amount of required fluid in order to prevent a false negative result. So ensure that adequacy indicator is blue before collection is complete. People often call fluid in the mouth um, saliva, but it actually consists of several different items. Um, it's an acidic water-based fluid that is comprised of electrolytes, salivary enzymes, you know, trace amounts of proteins, bacteria, and sometimes you know, food particulate matter. The function of oral fluid is to aid in digestion and ingestion, to protect against microorganisms such as bacteria, fungus, uh, viruses, and to protect the teeth against destructive elements. To better understand differences in interpreting results between oral fluid and urine, we should talk a little bit about the science behind it. When drugs are ingested, they are almost immediately circulating in the bloodstream and distributing to all the areas of the body. 
the body metabolizes these drugs and then eliminates them through urine, sweat, breath, etc. These metabolites are rapidly cleared from the blood and sent to waste. Therefore, you won't have high levels of metabolites in the blood. There, there's a very rich blood supply to the salivary glands where the drugs diffuse into the saliva from the bloodstream. And this is why oral fluid is considered a direct filtrate of blood. And you'll hear me say that a lot. It mimics what is in the bloodstream. And as a result, you won't traditionally get metabolites in oral fluid, uh, but mostly parent drugs. It is important to understand that every drug is different. There are several factors at play in predicting the amount of drug that will actually go into the oral fluid from blood. And I've listed them here. I don't expect you to memorize this, there won't be a quiz, but I wanted to give you an idea of the complexity that needs to be appreciated. All of these factors play a significant role in how we expect our results to show up, whether the drug is protein bound, its physical and chemical properties, the pH of the oral fluid, and several other factors all play a role. Now let's go over some considerations around oral fluid. As mentioned previously, you will see primarily parent drug and not metabolites. You know, urine is the opposite where you expect to see very large level of metabolites. Because oral fluid mimics the blood, it mimics blood's detection window as well, which is one to three days for most drugs. Oral fluid also has the added benefit of showing us drug use very quickly. Within an hour of use, the drug will show up in the oral fluid. And that's why it's a great tool for showing us very recent use. You will expect to see much lower levels of drugs in these results compared to urine. Uh, you know, urine is a reservoir matrix. And as drugs metabolize, they gather in the urine um, to higher levels between urinations. And as mentioned, you know, oral fluid is a snapshot of what's happening, so it doesn't accumulate to those high levels. One very important consideration with oral fluid is a sufficient waiting period before collection to ensure the oral cavity is clear of contamination and fully equilibrated to the blood. Most device companies suggest a minimum wait time of 10 minutes after using oral tobacco products, consuming any food or beverages, um, and this includes gum, candy, mouthwash. Eating and drinking can create additional saliva that can dilute down any drugs in the oral fluid that you're trying to find, potentially causing that false negative result. On the reverse, we get a lot of questions around, for example, mouthwash, causing positive alcohol tests. So waiting that full 10 minutes allows the oral cavity to equilibrate, to accommodate for both of these scenarios, and if observed, neither the false negative or positive result should occur. One scenario that can be troublesome is a dry mouth. Um, certain medications, such as opiates, illicit drugs like marijuana, can cause a, a dry mouth effect or, or cotton mouth. When this occurs, oral fluid can become very thick and slow production, preventing the successful collection. We do not recommend we try to stimulate production of saliva manually, for example, with sour candies, because as mentioned, you could cause a false negative. So in these scenarios, we often encourage the clients to drink water, wait an additional 10 minutes again, and to attempt a recollection. In these scenarios, you might consider collecting a urine specimen. So let's shift gears a little now and look at some specific examples on interpretation and some common questions around oral fluid. Here's an example of a sample where there are no metabolites present. This is what you expect to see in a totally normal oral fluid sample. Remember, oral fluid provides a snapshot of drugs actively circulating in the bloodstream, which are primarily parent, and the metabolites themselves are rapidly cleared from the body going to waste. In this example, here's a side-by-side -side of what you might see if you took both a urine sample and an oral fluid sample at exactly the same time. These samples are consistent with hydrocodone use. The urine at the bottom shows the parent drug, hydrocodone, and the metabolites, hydromorphone and norhydrocodone. At the top, 
we see the oral flu result with just the parent drug, hydrocodone, and no metabolites. These are both completely normal results. I'll also point out the cutoffs to the right. You see here the oral fluid is much lower than the urine cutoffs. Another common question is around THC. It is well known that THC is stored in the fat tissues of the body, so it can take some time to metabolize out completely. The longer you've used marijuana, the more often you've used it, the more it's stored. So it can take quite some time to leave the body completely and sometimes up to 45 days. But the concentration of urine is highly variable, so levels of THC can fluctuate day to day and throughout the day. And this can make interpretation of new use versus old use very difficult. So we utilize the creatinine level in the urine to normalize for this variability, reflected here as the THC to creatinine ratio. And it is the ratio you would use to determine new use or old use. With oral fluid, this is no longer an issue. Oral fluid is not subject to dilution effects and further does not reflect this trickling out effect of THC that we see in urine. A positive oral fluid result only reflects recent use in the last one to two days. Usually, a positive oral fluid THC result is actually from the residual THC absorbed into the oral surfaces from recent smoking and not from the blood at all. So you will see here the differences in how urine THC result and oral fluid result will look. In urine, you have the creatinine value and the ratio from the normalization. In oral fluid, it's not necessary, it's not appropriate to look for creatinine, so only the parent compound is listed. Two positives in a row, more than one to two days apart, reflect new use. Another consideration uh, in oral fluid testing is differences in looking for alcohol. Many have become really comfortable testing for ethyl glucuronide and ethyl sulfate in urine and prefer it over the standard ethanol testing because it provides a much longer window of detection over the standard test, up to 80 hours post-consumption, where you know, ethanol test itself is only very recent use of 8 to 10, 12 hours max. Unfortunately, we do not see that same benefit for ETG and oral fluid. Uh, as mentioned earlier, certain drugs don't cross into oral fluid and metabolites don't either. You see DPG and EPS are metabolites of alcohol. They don't show well in oral fluid. Therefore, the window of detection, if present at all, will mimic that of the standard ethanol test. So since there is no additional value in testing for ETG and oral fluid, if you're looking to test for alcohol use, we recommend ordering the standard parent ethanol test. Finally, a quick couple thoughts on dosing versus testing for oral medication-assisted treatment. In this example, we see very high levels of parent drug and no metabolites. While it isn't totally uncommon, as I mentioned, to not have metabolites, these high levels in oral fluid are not common. Results like this would indicate very recent sublingual dosing, resulting in a contaminated cavity. Ensure you wait a full hour after oral dosing before taking an oral fluid test to eliminate this possibility. You may prefer to take your oral fluid test um, you know, before your dosing occurs that day as well. And understand the cutoff values of your testing when evaluating buprenorphine. Buprenorphine is highly protein bound and low dosing may require a specialty cutoff. For example, Butrans is often found in much lower levels in oral fluid and urine because of its extended release formation. It requires a lower level reporting limit, specially designed for low level detection. So pay particular attention to that screen and confirmation cutoff that you are currently receiving and that perception of what might be a false negative. Um, buprenorphine levels in oral fluid may need a confirmation with a lower level cutoff, and it may not be detected if you were to run a screen alone. When interpreting oral fluid drug testing results, it's important to understand certain limitations. We talked before that every drug is different. The chemistry of how drugs enter the oral cavity is very complex. As a result, 
Some drugs don't favor going into oral fluid from the blood. And we have to appreciate those limitations. Um, we talked about THC, we talked about buprenorphine, and another one of those is the benzodiazepines. Benzodiazepines and buprenorphine are both highly protein bound, which means there just isn't much free drug floating around in the blood in order to go back into the oral fluid. So if you're concerned over a negative screen that should have been a, you know, an expected positive, right, your medication monitoring, and it's negative, you may consider ordering a confirmation for benzodiazepines and buprenorphine. The cutoffs for in confirmation techniques are much lower than screening techniques, so we'll capture a larger window of detection for these two particular drugs. And you see here a screening cutoff of 20 nanograms per milliliter. If you relied on the screen alone, you would have missed this low-level benzodiazepine clonazepam. Confirmation was required to detect this drug. And this would be especially true for certain benzos, such as clonazepam and lorazepam, because in addition to this problem, uh, their screening technologies are not as favorable for those two specific medications as they are for the other benzodiazepines. So I want to take a minute here and talk about the complexity of this matrix in the testing process as well, right? The elephant in the room. Um, oral fluid is complex, and it's made up of many different things. You've got food particles, potentially, drug, you know, potentially drugs, mucus, antibacterial compounds, various enzymes in addition to the water, and you have to consider the buffer solution composition in testing on this device. Because oral fluid is a complex sample, has low sample volume, low water content compared to urine, and much, much lower concentrations, there can be more variability when utilizing screening techniques. The lower concentrations will require lower screening cutoffs, and those much lower levels will have potentially more interferences in the screen than urine would. And this is why, absolutely, we recommend you always perform a confirmation on both urine and oral fluid specimens to eliminate the possibility of a false positive result. A presumptive screen is exactly that. It is presumptive. It is never wise to make decisions on your screening results alone. So let's summarize our key takeaways. First, Oral fluid drug testing is absolutely as reliable, sensitive, and accurate as urine testing. Advancements in technology, a better understanding of this sample type have moved us light years ahead of the oral fluid testing of the past. Second, as long as that 10 minute waiting period before collection is honored, it is almost impossible to adulterate the sample type. It's a gender neutral observed collection, every time ensuring against sample tampering and allowing for touchless collection and even video collections during these critical times of physical distancing. And it's not subject to dilution effects like urine. An individual can drink all the fluids they want and there will be no flushing effect like can be achieved with urine. You will need to get comfortable with seeing only parent drugs. And this is the last time I say it, I swear, with the possibility of no metabolites. Metabolites are not found in large abundance in the blood, so will not be in high abundance in the oral fluid. Next is the detection window of one to three days for most drugs. We have learned the oral fluid is a snapshot of you know, what is happening in the blood in real time. The window of detection will be similar to blood than urine, uh, more similar to blood than to urine which is why we need to be prepared for lower levels and the need for lower cutoffs in oral fluid over urine. Urine is that reservoir matrix, which means drugs and metabolites accumulate in high levels in between voids of blood and oral fluid. Uh, that just doesn't happen. If you're monitoring for medication adherence for benzodiazepine or buprenorphine, consider ordering a direct confirmation if you receive a negative screen. Finally, there is no trickling out effect for THC in oral fluid. THC will only be detected in new use. So to circle back to our initial question on which sample type is the best for drug testing, there is no best matrix for all drug testing. It all boils down to the information you're trying to gather 
the conditions and risk level of the participant, and the environment you are working in. You, know, you want to choose the right testing at the right time to get what are you trying to accomplish. 